you've tuned into the open classroom. Uh, my name is Ted Lance Mark. I'm director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy. And uh, I happen to be on the road on a research project this evening, so you won't see my background, but I am here uh, and delighted to be able to introduce uh, my colleague, Rebecca Riccio, who will uh, start off a fascinating conversation on a highly propitious day in Boston's history. Uh, sometimes when we plan our sessions, we uh, don't always coordinate our scheduling with uh, public announcements, but uh, you'll hear uh, some wonderful news uh, in uh, tonight's discussion. So with that, um, I will turn the screen over to my colleague, Rebecca Riccio. Thank you, Ted, for joining us from the road. I think that's a first for Open Classroom. It's exciting to know that we can uh, be on the move and still be on the screen at the same time. Uh, welcome, everybody. We got off to a great start last week talking about principles of ethical community engagement and how it is that we center the voices of communities and the decisions that affect their lives. And Ted mentioned an important announcement. I am going to pass on actually sharing that. Uh, because it's not my news to share. We actually have folks here tonight who have been doing this work for a long time. Uh, and so we're going to keep you on the edge of your seats a little bit longer. And I'm going to just pass the baton really quickly uh, to one of our newest members of the policy school faculty and someone we are just absolutely thrilled to have with us, Kim Lucas. Kim, thank you for pulling together this amazing panel. And, and now I'm going to pass things off to you. You can decide if you want to share the announcement or give it to somebody else to share. Well, thank you, Ted and Rebecca. And uh, this is just so exciting. I'm so glad to be on the second class of Open Classroom this semester. Um, and as I, as Rebecca mentioned, my name is Kim Lucas. I'm a professor of the practice of public policy and economic justice here at Northeastern University. And my research and my work all try to bridge research policy and practice. And while academically speaking, I am a qualitative sociologist, I actually think that my superpower, one thing that I'm really good at is designing research and translating data in ways that are usable for practitioners and policymakers. And over the years, I've found that I can't do work for or even with the community um, to do that kind of work well. Uh, I actually need to be an active part of the community and I really want to get that right. Um, and so what that means is offering my skills, my resources, and my network to support my community's wants and needs. And it also means making sure to bring my community along with me every chance I get. Uh, and so with that in mind, I uh, wanted to use this platform, this stage, this opportunity at Open Classroom to introduce all of you uh, out there to some of the amazing folks in Boston's early childhood community, which is the area of research that I know best and a community that I try to support with my work as a civically engaged researcher. Uh, my goal in doing this is to give you, our audience, an understanding of who Boston's early childhood community is made of, what folks in this community have been and continue to work on, uh, why early childhood is important to them, but also an invitation for you to participate in and support this community yourselves. Um, this panel, uh, as Rebecca and Ted have both mentioned, I will, I will do this just to get it out of the way. I know so much suspense. Uh, this panel comes at an exciting time and with many changes to the early childhood and child care landscape, including today's announcement by Mayor Wu uh, of an office of uh, early childhood that is completely new at the city of Boston. So yay, um, this is a long time coming. So many people, including folks up on this stage, um, have been working for years hard uh, on getting something like this off the ground. And here we are with more work to do, but I think that we're in a moment of celebration for sure. Uh, tonight's program, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of how we're going to do tonight's program. Um, so we'll just kind of kick it off um, with our facilitator and panelists introducing themselves and their work. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions. And that's basically it. 
our facilitator Gloria will kick off the question portion of the evening and I encourage anybody out there to shout out your questions using the Q&A feature uh, so that we can lift them up for the panelists. Um, and before I turn it over to Gloria to introduce herself um, and, I, and all of the amazing work that she's been doing, I do want to shout out to Carrie Moore, who is an early educator at Ellis Early Learning, who was really integral in planning tonight's panel, but unfortunately could not make it out. Um, Carrie, you are missed. Um, and with that, uh, I'm just going to cede my time and hand everything over to Gloria. Gloria, uh, take it away, and uh, I will definitely be here uh, to help support you as you facilitate. Good evening, everybody. So great to meet everyone and see everyone. Um, I'm Gloria Valentin Denson. I am a family child care educator. Been doing this work for the last 22 years. I was inspired to do this work because I had two young children and I someone planted the seed that I could do this work at home and um, work and be with my children, which is what I wanted and ended up just loving it so much throughout the years. I currently focus on preschool children. Um, at the beginning of my career, I started with mixed ages of infants and toddlers. And for the past 15 years, I've been focusing on just preschool education. Um, I'm located in High Park, Massachusetts. And um, I am a four day program um, with a diverse and just amazing group of children and families in my community and beyond. Um, this work inspires me because of just the joy that it brings on an everyday basis. I am currently um, the president of the Boston chapter of MAYC, um, which I've been sitting on that um, post for the past almost year. It's been a great learning experience, meeting and collaborating with other folks in my field and um, a diverse um, group of people. I've also been part of the Strategies for Children um, Advocacy Network group, which has been another learning experience on ways that I can collaborate and um, support other family child care educators, which is my goal to bring our work to, you know, bring the quality of our work out in the forefront because we do, it, is, it could be a very isolating work, but through networking and exposing the work that we do um, through advocacy and exposure, um, my goal is to just, you know, put us like highlight us a bit more. And um, so I did say I've been doing this for 22 years, um, four children, and I'm also a grandma, which my grandson is in my preschool program. He's, if you hear a little voice, he's upstairs because he's sleeping over tonight. Um, so I'm just happy to meet everyone. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy for learning with you all. And um, Thank you. Great. And Gloria, do you want to um, call our panelists up to introduce themselves? Oh, yes, absolutely. That's important. <laughs> um, so we have a great group of panelists here. Um, um, and I'll call people's name out. OK, if that's OK. So we'll start with Wayne. If you can introduce yourself. You guys hear me fine? Good evening. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Ted, Rebecca, Kim, and Gloria. Um, introduce myself. So I am, the way I think of myself is I am the son of Marcia and David. I am the brother of six children, of six siblings. I am husband to Jennifer and I am father to Janae. And those really are my primary um, definition of who I am. Um, and then there's the rest of me, which is someone committed and somewhat obsessed with the uh, field of early education and care, um, at which I've been working on for 32 years, I think, <laughs> which has been a while. Um, I have worked as a teacher. Uh, director, 
CEO, research, many different roles over time, which I will talk about um, as this hour goes along. Um, and I am a resident of Roxbury, Massachusetts for the last 20 years. Thank you, Wayne. Um, next up is Tiara. Hello, everyone. My name is Tiara Dias, and thank you so much for having me. I started my career at 14 years old uh, through ABCD Summer Works, and I worked at a place called Little People's Playhouse. Um, I went on to work at a uh, organization called Bright Horizons, and I wore a birthday bear costume and handed out pizza uh, for children at birthday parties. And I moved on from there to become a teacher and a uh, education coordinator, a director, um, and eventually moved from Bright Horizons into Boston Public Schools to manage a federal grant. Um, uh, it was called the Preschool Expansion Grant. Um, but I'm now currently in my position as the Universal Pre-K Director. And what I currently do is ensure that our families across Boston have access to high quality care. Whether you are in a community-based organization or the public schools or family child care, we wanna make sure that there's no wrong door. And so my job is to make sure that I'm helping to connect families as much as possible to that high quality experience. Um, if you think about universal pre-K as three and four-year-olds, the announcement that uh, Kim just talked about, Mayor Wu is gonna expand to make sure that it includes infants and toddlers. It includes family childcare like um, Gloria's programs, as well as career development. I'm sure you're gonna hear from Anne, but really making sure that people like me who start off as a birthday bear can grow into um, positions like the one I'm in now. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tiara, so much. Okay, next up, Binal. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm so excited to be here with this amazing group of participants and panelists. Uh, my name is Binal Patel. I am the Chief Program Officer at Neighborhood Villages. Um, I actually started with a completely different career. I graduated with a degree in economics and computer science, and I thought I wanted to do marketing and worked for corporate for a little bit. Absolutely hated it. Um, and my supervisor told me, it, I just didn't, I was a hard worker and I didn't seem passionate. I didn't seem to care about the money. And I was like, yep, I really don't. And so <laughs> I left my job one day, became a teacher and I've never looked back. I absolutely love it. Um, I love this field. I love the passion of the field and became a preschool teacher for many years. Um, eventually opened a childcare program and became a director and then transitioned to nonprofit systems work at Neighborhood Villages. And a lot of what drives my work, actually everything that drives my work is my love and passion for educators. I think educators are the foundation of this field. They are the ones that take care of the children and we need to take care of them. And so that's really where my advocacy and my drive comes from. Um, and I'm excited to um, hear from panelists and also share with you all some of the work that Neighborhood Villages has done um, over the past few years, but it is a very exciting day in Boston and we are excited to be part of it. Um, I'm also a mother of two, I guess they're not young children anymore, they're seven and nine, um, growing very, very quickly, but that was one of the reasons, one of my inspirations for starting that program is I was pregnant at the time and didn't know where my infant was going to go. And I know that's an inspiration for a lot of mothers in the field. And I resonate with that as well. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Binal. And next is Anne. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Anne Douglas, and I'm a professor of early childhood education at UMass Boston, and also the founding executive director of our Institute for Early Education Leadership and Innovation. And I've been at UMass Boston since 2009 and came there after working for more than 20 years in the early care and education field, primarily in Dorchester. Uh, where I ran a child care program. I've been an infant toddler teacher. I've been an after school teacher. I've been
been a center director and I've been a family child care provider um, and as well as a quality improvement coach. So I've done a lot of things in the field. I loved the field. Um, it was very hard to leave direct service. That's why I was there for more than 20 years. But what happened is that I started to see so many systemic issues affecting the field and I felt like I could only make the an impact uh, to some degree in the position that I was in. And so I was looking for ways to have a greater impact. And one of those ways was being a part of a group of early educators in Boston who was advocating for greater access to undergraduate, to the bachelor's degree for early educators who wanted to go back and get the degree and use it to inform their work in the field and their leadership in the field. And so after 20 years in the field, I went back, I got my PhD um, at the Heller School of Brandeis in Early Childhood Social Policy, and about the time I was finishing, a position, a brand new position opened up at UMass Boston to launch this bachelor's degree program designed for members of the early childhood workforce. So classes were in the evening or they were online and transfer credits from all different institutions were accepted. So I came to UMass Boston to launch that program in 2009. It grew from a a cohort of about 10 people the first year to now almost 400 students uh, studying early childhood education, working towards their bachelor's degree, many working in the field, transferring their credits in from community college. So um, I, uh, it was my dream job to really bridge kind of the worlds of research policy and practice, bring the expertise and the passion I have uh, for developing leadership uh, in the field and driving change from within the field rather, from pe rather than from people who are outside the field, which has been a long tradition uh, in this sector. And I'll, I'll get a chance to talk more about that, I'm sure, as, as our hour progresses. But thank you. Thank you, Anne. Great. I think we're ready to launch into just a few questions that I think Carrie, who I mentioned couldn't join us, um, but also Gloria and myself, and all, actually all of the panelists too, have kind of co-crafted. I think this is a testament to our collaborative nature here uh, in this field. Um, and so um, we'll launch into the questions. Gloria has some teed up, um, but just a reminder for folks who are out there to toss in any questions you have and an invitation also, Rebecca and Ted, I know you're up here on this panel, but also feel free to um, add in your questions that you might have as, as, you, as we start kind of talking through the work that we've been doing. Awesome, okay. So um, the first question is gonna go to Tiara. Um, what's the theory of change that drives your work? Awesome. <clears throat> so um, I think one of the important things to know about my role as the Universal Pre-K Director is it's really about creating um, and helping to strengthen a partnership between families and community partners and the public schools. Um, and there's, Wayne has indicated, has historically been building this work in Boston. And so I think one of the biggest theories of change is to make sure that you have a shared governance model to which um, everyone is helping to inform the development of um, early education and what universal pre-K look like. Um, and when, so when we say everyone, you have to think through who are the invested stakeholders, um, A, that are able to um, access the table to share their thoughts, but also what are the other ways that they can participate? So, you know, just starting with families, um, you know, providers, um, uh, funders, uh, the state and the city, uh, but also most importantly, children. What do we learn from the experiences that they're having in the classroom? And what are the different spaces that we're creating for them to do that? So I think when we talk about a shared governance, it really means um, not only what are the formal, but maybe the informal ways that we're also connecting and learning. Um, I think it also is important to note that data informs um, everything. And so being able to take a step back, do some reflection, and really be able to take that data in to inform the direction of your work. Um, I have certainly learned over time that as much as I have, you can tell from now, have a lot to say, it's important to step back, right? And listen and better understand what the, the data is telling us, um, as well as, as I mentioned, that shared governance. So I would say shared governance, reflection, and data is part of that theory of change. 
Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is going to be for Anne. Um, what do you think is the most important thing a person can provide a child as a teacher? Thank you for that question. I love that question. I think that the most important thing a teacher can provide for a child is to find that child's strengths and greatest assets. And I'm going to give you an example um, where I saw this in action. And it actually isn't from my professional career. It's from my life uh, as a mother. When my son, who's now almost 21, was uh, in first grade, he um, he started first grade and I got a call from the child, my son's teacher on the first day of school and he left a message and I was instantly worried. He had had some challenges in kindergarten. So I thought, oh my gosh, it's the first day of school. He's already, there's already an issue. The teacher's already calling. And it turned out what the teacher was calling to say was that he loved getting to know my son and he already has discovered that my son has a wonderful sense of humor and he's so looking forward to the year with him. And I never forgot that story because on day one, this teacher, he probably called every parent, this teacher looked for what is the greatest strength and talent. And in fact, my son has an amazing sense of humor. Even as a child, he seemed to understand adult humor. And so the fact that the teacher saw something in him. So I think that's what teachers can do. And I think it's what, what we do in our work with, with early educators is to recognize the incredible strengths and talents that each of us bring and how do we and you enhance that and cultivate that and recognize that. It's very powerful. That's amazing. Um, okay. Do we want to take a moment just to um, answer a few questions for Anne and Tiara, um, Tiara before we, we move on to the other panelists? Yeah, I think uh, any interesting reactions or thoughts just to add into the mix for okay. Anne or Tiara. Okay, um, so next we go to Binal. Um, we want to give high quality care to everyone, but the reality is that some communities are impacted more or less by social and economic issues. What are the best ways to invest in or support high quality early education for everyone in Boston. So as I started um, saying in my introduction as well, I really think the foundation of this field are the early educators and any investment that we wanna make in high quality education starts with an investment in the educators. So the, the very first thing would need to be to pay these educators a respectable living wage so that they can continue to do the very amazing and very challenging work that they do, but so important. And these are not these are not babysitters. These are not people who are taking care of the children's day. They are taking care of the children and their brain development and their families and their social emotional. And it's really important work that educators are trained to do and continue to be trained and continue to learn for their whole life. So I think the very first investment, the very first part of this conversation is investment in the early educators. And then I think there's really three legs of the stool to an investment in, in high quality early education. There's the infrastructure investment in things like a, a workforce pipeline and operations and COVID testing, for example, and resources that programs need that often they can't access in the way that K through 12 schools can. So there's infrastructure, there's the instructional support and the high quality instruction, and that's based in, in all the data and the research and the knowledge and the expertise. And, and then the third one is the support for families and the family navigation and being able to wrap around families and to, to be able to support their children. And that ranges from families that might need support in finding housing, in finding employment, in food, all the way to supporting a family in, in, in questions that they have about their child and the development of their child and really wrapping around that whole child includes supporting the family. So I think it's First, it starts with an investment in the educators, and then there's the, up, the infrastructure, the instruction, and the family support.
Thank you, Binal. Um, and next we turn it over to Wayne. Um, we know the importance of early education now more than ever. What do you think the field is missing, if anything? Jeez, oh, that's a tough one, Gloria. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, one of the things is we, we've known the importance of early education for quite some time. And obviously, as everyone's been saying for the last two, two years, COVID has just accentuated that. What I do think the field, however, still is, needs to struggle with and doesn't quite, I believe, fully grasp is sort of the difference between what I think of, what we might think of as policy and systems. In some ways, we think that moving policy is the top of the pyramid, right? or I don't know if that's the right framing. Um, and I would suggest that really policy is embedded within the, a system and that that system has um, uh, there are things that underlie that system. Two of them that come to my mind is the, um, both the sexism and the racism that exist in our society, because those two isms really undermine our ability as a society to invest in the, res the resources we need in order to meet the needs of children and in order to meet the needs of mothers, quite frankly, um, and, and to pay the, the, the work is primarily done by women, so to pay those women the wages that they deserve and they've earned. Um, and so I think if we can figure out what are the levers that we can move in order to address those underlying forces that restrain us as a society from making the investments that we need to make, um, if we could figure those out, then we will have, I think, actually finally gotten to the pieces of the puzzle that are still missing. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it strikes me as a very interesting thing. If I, if I go back, if I go to um, the national level for a second, and I think of the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better legislation, and that the infrastructure bill passed and Build Back Better didn't, well, the majority of jobs that infrastructure bill will support are jobs that men will fill. The majority of jobs that Build Back Better would have filled are the ones that women would usually fill. And so without perhaps intent, I don't, I, you know, I don't know the, the legislators making the decisions, um, the, uh, the, the way that systems work and play in our brain it makes it very difficult for us to make the, the decisions that are actually very helpful. Um, so anyway, that's my long, uh, rather long answer, Gloria, uh, saying that I think grasping the difference between policy and systems and the levers that move the system in the direction that we want is for me the thing that remains to be done. Thank you, that was, am that was amazing. Um, so I'm um, just, Kim, if you could just give me a little, do we have a little time for a couple more questions? I think we do, but before we um, go through some of the questions that we already have, I think just writing off of what Wayne just said, Valerie posed a question in the chat, um, or in the Q&A, sorry, um, that might be, uh, you know, kind of relevant here. Um, Valerie asks, can early educators do more to address racism through multicultural curricula. Um, and I'm curious, you know, from, from all of your perspectives, yourself included, Gloria, like what your thoughts are on this. Um, I, I can add a little bit to that. Um, so we're currently planning an anti-bias curriculum for early educators circling back this um, this um, offering for early early educators um, because it is so important we you know work in the city of Boston where it's diverse and we want to be able to um, be able to meet the needs of all the children that we care for and be sensitive and knowledgeable that representation is everything and how important it is and welcoming it is to families to feel like they are represented or they are valued. 
um, by, you know, by culture, by beliefs, um, and it goes on and on. So I feel like having these opportunities to talk about things openly, especially nowadays with the, with the climate that we're living in, is crucial to have those uncomfortable conversations or you know, for providers to take these classes and educate themselves on how to handle or how to address children from all types of backgrounds so that no one feels left out and everyone is included. I would, I would love to just add to that. I, I absolutely agree with what Gloria has said and that early educators actually have a huge role to play because we know that the research shows that bias starts at infancy. And so to wait to have these conversations until children are older is actually a disservice to them. And so, in, and I've always taught in programs that had infant, toddler and preschool rooms and we wouldn't wait until they were preschool age when they were having conversations. It's really being aware of the environment and the materials and everything that Gloria said and being inclusive to families. But it's also about there are different cultures that raise children differently, that hold them differently, that put them to sleep differently, that call milk different things. And it's really important to be aware of these and bring those into your classrooms. And so I think, I think absolutely early educators play a huge role in this. I'm sorry, just to tie that up, I would say it's important to make sure that families are participating in building and writing that curriculum, right? That this shouldn't be something that is done to them. To Bino's point, in order for us to make sure that it's culturally appropriate and that it's um, developmentally appropriate, we have to make sure that we're including families in building that curriculum. Thank you. I'll just um, also add into the conversation. I completely agree with things other panelists have said and um, that there is so much work being done to really think in advance, how do we um, teach children from an anti-bias perspective and how do we support ourselves as the adults in this field um, to continue to grow and to, um, to act in ways that um, are anti-racist and reflect anti-bias approaches. And one of the, I think, incredible assets of our field uh, that's very distinct from other education sectors is that it's a small business sector essentially. It's not a large public bureaucracy. It is very much a small business sector, and it's primarily dominated by women, women and minority business owners. And what that means on the ground for children and families is that children and families have access in many cases, not all, there are many issues with access and many inequities with access, but there are many children and families who are choosing care from childcare providers who reflect their cultural, linguistic, um, and ethnic backgrounds and in ways that are very affirming for children uh, in their very early years and provide um, really a network and community of support uh, in local neighborhoods. So I think that this, um, the localness and the small business um, com aspects of the early childhood sector are an asset that no matter what happens with Build Back Better or universal child care that preserving, and Boston has done an amazing job with this, with universal child care, is thinking about how do we preserve these incredible assets around racial and linguistic and cu cultural diversity that exist in the early childhood sector in a unique way and build a system that preserves and extends that. This is awesome. I'm just going to toss in another question from the chat. If, as you can tell, I'm the chat fielder here. Um, that Emily poses, um, kind of, I'll riff off of your what you just said, Anne, um, just to kind of extend this idea of being an asset to the community, not just to young children. What, Emily asks, what does community engagement look like with building early childhood programs? So, how would you balance? local control with reactionary parents. Um, and uh, Emily cites uh, thinking about book the book banning trend. Mm. 
could I take a stab at, at Emily? I apologize. I'm going to go in a slightly variation from your question, but it's what your question makes me think about. Um, one of the sayings I used to use some years ago was children come with families and families live in communities. And, and, and that simply was a shorthand for saying, if we want children to thrive, we need to make it an important mission of ours to help parents to thrive. Um, and if we want parents to thrive, they need that they are supported and or held back by the by the community they're in and whether that community is thriving. And so the way I sort of think about it is if we invest in making in helping communities to be strong, then those communities will be very, very active, engaging, vibrant places for families to be and for parents to be and parents will create the environment that children need to thrive. Um, and so it's not often that communities need to somehow, or people in communities, because that's really what communities are, is, a, is just a, is a um, group of individual people. It's not so much that they need to find a role themselves, you know, everyone needs to find a role within a childcare organization, um, but they need to be a place that is safe for that child, right? that is safe for that mother, that is safe for that father, that has the jobs that those individuals need. Um, because if you don't have the jobs, then it's hard for those people to become the kind of individuals we want them to be. And so really the way I sort of think about it is we need to figure out, and we know how to do this stuff. Like this is not rocket science. But, um, like we know how to help communities to thrive. Um, and so I think once we make those decisions and those investments, and this goes back to, to the, my earlier thought about not, not so much the sexism part, but the racism part, right? Like if, if we somehow value black and brown lives less, then we will not make the investment in those communities that allow them to thrive. Um, and we don't get therefore the outcomes for children that we all want for children. Um, so that's sort of my take on it. Any additional thoughts on the community engagement? I'd love to jump in with one, if I may, because Kim, I remember when we were thinking about this panel and you said, this group of people shows how powerful it is when people who have taught in their communities rise up into positions of leadership in education and into policy making and into systems change that will affect their communities. And I would love it if any of you would talk about that because I think education is one of the most essential places where the people who are doing the policy making ought to really understand what it feels like to be in that child care center, to be in that classroom, um, and, and would love to sort of hear your thoughts on, on that idea that Kim centered when we were thinking about this panel. I, I would be happy to go first. I mean, and I think I talked about my, my birthday beer experience. Um, and really the, the happiest times of my life were in the classroom. Um, just, you know, being on a walk with my toddlers and singing, um, you know, and just walking and being. Um, and if I could make enough money, I would have stayed there. Um, certainly, I think that part of the push is, um, as Bino has indicated, just a salary. Um, my daughter is now 20, um, but I remember when she went into um, public schools I didn't like her classroom. I didn't like her school. And I said, I had been at my job for Bright Horizons almost 19 years at the time. And I was like, you know what? I, I want to be the change. You know what I mean? I want to be the change. And I was petrified. You know, I went back to school and got my master's degree and um, pursued this position in Boston Public Schools. And I think one thing I didn't expect was for it to take so long, for it to be so challenging, right? Like I was like, oh, I'm gonna be the change, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of it involves just, you know, as I mentioned, just stepping back and listening, not taking things so personal, being able to understand so many different perspectives. I mean, we're talking about book bannings. And so really like, what is the space to do that? And then ultimately thinking, what are the decisions 
impact the most vulnerable students um, that we care about, the voices that can't um, be at the table, the people that may not have been like, you know what, I'm going to jump and leave this job and pursue something else. So, um, and I'm grateful for all the people that slowed me down and, you know, said like, hey, let me, let me teach you a few things in a way that felt like respectful and kind. Um, and me being able to have the um, humbleness to just be like, <laughs> listen. So um, I think that that to this day is something I carry um, often. And I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but yeah, I think definitely just wanting to be the change as much as possible. And I know that phrase is somewhat corny, but I hope my daughter is looking and like, oh, she's cool. You know, she's really did it. So I think it depends on the day, but anyways. <laughs> to add to what Tiara said too, um, as an educator, I, and I moved from the corporate world to education, and I was just so happy to be in a job that I loved and wanted to wake up in the morning and go to and never saw myself doing anything other than being an educator. I just, I loved being with children and I still love being with children. And, uh, you know, circumstances just happened. But when I became a director, I thought I was missing something. Like, I, I was like, well, I didn't really plan to be a director. It just sort of happened. So here I am. But the, the families are all telling me that the tuition is too high and it's 25,000 for an infant. And clearly this is way too much. And the teachers are all quitting because the salary is too low. And I remember trying to reach out to other directors saying, I've missed something. Like there's, there's something wrong in my formula or budget, right? Because I'm a new director. I don't know. You tell me. And the board is all parents. And like, what are we missing? Everyone else is making this work. And I think that's what really propelled me into the systems change work, because after a few years and after building a, a community of administrators and educators, and we were all singing the same story, um, but not to each other. We were really just trying to figure it out and, and, and take the side of the families one, one year and, and not increase tuition and then take the side of the educators the next year and increase salaries. And it just, it feels like a tug of war constantly. And you're just so in it. And when you take a minute to step back and build this community and you're realizing it's a broken system and we all need to build this community together. And I'm so grateful to have this panel that you've all put together of people that have come from the field. And I hope it empowers others to really rise up in whatever that looks like. And it, it doesn't mean you need to, to leave the field and take another job, and you certainly can, or even in your role as an educator and, and as an administrator, we're all one community working to change this broken system that doesn't work. And I think it was empowering and it was enlightening to realize at some point, it's not me. <laughs> Um, I'm not doing something that there is no magic formula. It really just doesn't work. I have a, a policy question uh, related to what you've all been saying, and that is um, public officials um, all talk very generally uh, and enthusiastically about how children are our future. And yet you've described a system that is uh, broken or troubled uh, and, and uh, full of, of holes that make it possible for young people to just kind of disappear. Why is it so hard, uh, even with community engagement, uh, to get uh, uh, public officials and corporate leaders uh, to uh, fulfill uh, the statements that they make uh, about the importance of supporting young children? I'll, I'll take a stab, Ted. Um, I, I think I, I think increasingly, well, so, so I want to go back to I, I, I think that because increasingly this work is this work is being done by women of color and immigrant women and women period. I actually I can't overstate, I think, how difficult it is for policymakers to make decisions that, advent, that advantage women and women of color. Um, but sadly, I also think that it's a very difficult thing um, it's a more difficult thing than we imagine to love other people's children. Um, 
like we want we all want the best for our kids and and we will go to amazing lengths um i, I have worked um with, with uh, some of the most challenging parents um that have harmed their children over the years and yet they loved their children deeply um so we all love our children but i do think it is hard to create policies and expend resources when it's someone else's child and it sounds simplistic but i have thought about that for you for quite some time ted because i have worked so hard over the years um, with politicians who are good human beings who say all the right things and when it's time to make a decision um, I, I, but, but I also think it's also about competition for other resources. Um, and so in a very practical sense, and I don't mean to put healthcare in a, in a, on, on a difficult position, but in a very practical way, healthcare has eaten up increasingly more and more of, at least in Massachusetts state budget over the years, and it's made it very difficult for the state to fund other things. Um, and so I think a combination of those forces, um, having said that, I am at my most optimistic that I have been in about 20 years because I can feel in some way that I don't know how to quite describe, I can feel the um, coalescence of, of, of thought and emotions that that gives us a future that, that allows me to see a future that that I hadn't quite expected um, you know um, I, I believe Bob Delia works at Northeastern now if I'm not mistaken I remember when Bob was the uh, was heading up the house and I worked with him uh, for some years and I could see an arc of change with with Bob Delio where he was begin where he sort of really grasped the importance of child care for other people's children. Um, and so I, I, I just I can see it coming. And I, I also think um, policymakers listen to their constituents and constitu constituents are all of us. And those that are the most impacted by the broken system and by early childhood are families of young children. But their children are young for exactly five years. And then there is an option for free public education and there are options for private education, but there are options and those don't exist for zero to five. And so often the struggle in getting all constituents behind this one issue is that families will often figure it out because it's such a short period of time. But, and we've, we've had these conversations as well. We need to get the 20 year olds to care and the 30 year olds. And because imagine what your life will look like when you're in your mid thirties and you're about to launch a career and you have to stop everything because you have to stay home and take care of your child or you're spending your mortgage that you could invest in a property take, you know, towards childcare. And so really, I think all of us, if we all got together and told the policymakers, I am a childcare voter, they would listen. And childcare is really the only issue, the only investment that can have a multi-generational impact. So by supporting childcare, you are supporting current families who are working in the economy, but you're supporting the children of tomorrow's economy. And so you're really impacting not just current, but future generations and the future growth of the economy. And really that's what we should all be telling them. Well, what would you suggest um, is, are, are the tools for bringing about that kind of change in cultural perception of how important young kids are? I mean, what, what do we need to do to change that perception? I was going to say what I basically said in the chat, which is that, you know, 
early education is a public good that we should all invest in because you will see a return on this investment, right? I think that COVID, what Wayne, when Wayne was talking, I was thinking about how COVID really helped people see how important early education is. And we're like, told you so, right? But like, if you make this investment on early education now, it pays off and if businesses saw it that way. So if the racism and the sexism isn't enough and the public good isn't enough, if you see it as an investment that pays off um, in businesses um, where you have more flexibility, right? Um, you can transition into a job different in a different way. Like those all feel like ways that may incentivize us all to make that investment. Um, may I take a stab? Um, I, I, some years ago, I used to run an organization and um, on, on my board was a member of the Supreme Judicial Court. And she sat on the court when they made the, um, the decision, the school reform uh, decisions, uh, court decisions that sort of changed education in Massachusetts. Um, and she said to me, um, the driving force behind that change was business. Um, and so I, I think one, we can't underestimate the importance of business in making the change in, uh, in getting the policy changes made. And about two years ago, about three years ago now, I remember I was in a meeting with a group of business leaders from across the state and they were gung-ho on childcare. I had never been in a group of business meeting before, business leaders where childcare was their number one priority. And it was because at that time, the labor market was tight and they needed employees, they needed workers. And when they looked around Massachusetts, under educate the under um, the unemployed or underemployed were primarily women, and if they wanted women to work for them, they needed to help women solve some of their key challenges for coming to the workforce. The biggest one of which was child and senior care, and I think that that um, um, that self interest. Which is not a bad thing, right? So I think most of us have things that are, you know, so, um, but understanding that self interest and using that as a lever to make the policy change is perhaps one of the things or the avenues that are available to us. Um, and out of that, and, and, and we have seen now what's, em what's emerged is a business coalition for early care and education. Um, so I think continuing to you to sort of figure out how to help business see the value of childcare for their bottom line is um, perhaps an avenue we need to lean into more. Childcare is a race issue. It's a sex issue. It's an economic issue. It's a business. It should be everyone's issue. <laughs> So I did want to share something really quick. Um, as a family childcare educator, um, you know, this work can be very isolating, especially, you know, for myself. As an example, I work by myself with a group of five children. Um, I'm alone, you know, four days a week with these children. Um, but what I find important is that with the information or the knowledge that I'm receiving through, example, something like what we're doing tonight, sharing it with other educators, and have you know empowering them or share their information so they can advocate also for their programs for their families and their communities sometimes again because this could be a very isolating and sometimes we just can't find our voice and we just need someone to plug in and plant that seed for us to then keep it moving because there is a gem in this family child care program you know these five children that i'm taking care of every day there is an impact that they are you know an impact that i'm having in their lives and the lives of their families so that's that drives me to keep going but the investment and the you know the investment and the and the quality of the work that that we need to show the communities at large we have to get our word out there and so for me, it's like not keeping everything that I know to myself, but calling people and saying, hey, this is happening. I think you would be great at this. This is a good opportunity for us. 
to showcase the work that we're doing or to advocate for the needs, for individual needs and community needs. But I feel like for me, sharing is what the importance for me is sharing this information and what is needed. One last question from me, and that is um, when Head Start came into being, there was a lot of data that was used to explain why the investment was important in the long run. And I'm wondering what the, the data points or metrics need to be now in order to engage some of the younger people that you're referring to, and, and uh, very importantly, to engage the policymakers in making the choice in favor of um, this kind of investment versus the other kinds of investments that uh, can be made. Um, one thing, Ted, I think is actually focusing on really looking closely at the data. So what, one of the things, for example, um, I, I do some work with the Center on the Developing Child that's led by a guy named Jack Shankoff. Um, and Jack doesn't produce research, but he captures and puts them, to, and puts them together in a way that I can understand. <laughs> Um, and one of the things he, he's done is he's presented data on the um, effectiveness of childcare, high quality childcare programs. Um, and one of the things, one of the, one of the data points that we use all the time in our field to talk about quality is third grade reading. But when, when they look at third grade reading scores, they don't really see an improvement between um, children who are in the high quality and the ones who weren't. However, if you look at their health, they're healthier in all kinds of dimensions. They're, they make more money when, they've, when they get to adulthood. Um, they are less involved in the justice system. Um, there, there's a host of data points that we can choose from. Um, and, but we keep choosing the one that actually turns out isn't right. Um, because, and, and I don't know, I can't say because, um, so I will, I will leave the because alone, but I, there are so many, um, that there are at least three or four longitudinal studies that's been tracking kids, uh, human beings for over like 30, 20 to 40 years. Um, that's really um, produced some great data um, for us to use. Um, and so I, I think we have a lot to choose from, um, but sometimes it's not the obvious one. Um, you know, we, we all thought that reading must be a great indication and it, it seemed like it, it seems like it makes sense. Um, but it turns out that um, it, it doesn't tell anywhere near the real story. I'll just kind of swoop in because I know we're close to the end of our time together and say that as a qualitative researcher in this space, right, what I have invited all of you out there in the audience to do is listen to these five amazing leaders who are local. And this is what qualitative research is. It's sitting back and listening. And in my work, one thing I've learned is really that when you sit back and you listen, you hear the solutions you hear what the indicators are. You hear what, how we can right size what success is for the future. And you can hear the innovation that is already in the field. Um, each of the leaders here on the panel and Gloria as the facilitator are folks who have done the work and who now lead the work. And that is exactly what this community is for itself. 
we as researchers, we as data analysts, we as business people, we as everybody else who's not in the midst of it, we've got work to do too to help support all the good things that are coming out of this field um, and all the good things that are to come. And so very quickly, I would like to invite all five of you um, to share if there's one thing that anybody who's listening in on this panel or on this recording um, should take away, um, what should that be? And if there's anything that you would want to ask them to do, you don't have to, but if there's anything that you'd like to ask folks to do um, to support your work or others work in the field, uh, Let's do a, a round robin. So maybe we'll do Binal and then Anne and then uh, Tiara and then Wayne and then Gloria. One thing to take away. Um, I think for me that that's actually that the time is now. I think what Wayne said earlier that there, there's a momentum and there's a collaboration and there's just there's a movement like I've never seen before. And so if if in our lifetime, in our generation, we're gonna make this happen, it feels like the time is now. So I hope everyone's feeling that, that has joined that and can, can be a part of that. And um, I think in terms of the work that we do, I, I would love people to visit the website, but also the Neighborhood Villages Action Fund, which is really focused on the advocacy work and talking with policymakers and lawmakers and to really make that change. And it's as simple as saying, I'm a child care voter to your local legislator. And if that's all you do after this, that will get us one step closer. What I would ask people to take away is uh, uh, awareness and recognition of the incredible talent and leadership within the early childhood workforce and how it, important it is for those closest to the work to be leading and doing the advocacy and uh, generating solutions to solve these problems. And what I would invite you to do, we do training uh, across the country, developing the entrepreneurial leadership of early educators as agents of change in this field. We've trained hundreds of people um, across the country. And uh, every year in May, this year, May 14th, we have our annual leadership leadership forum that centers and elevates the expertise of early educators and people who come to that event um, tell me time and time again that they are blown away. They had no idea what the talent in this workforce is. And so I want to just make that visible to more and more people. So if you visit our website, you can sign up to, uh, this is at the Institute for Early Education Leadership and Innovation at UMass Boston. You can sign up to get um, uh, updates and emails from us, newsletters, and you can find out about our leadership forum and it's free and I invite you to attend May 14th. Awesome. And I would just say to for all of us to consider yourself educators and, and advocates. Um, you know, I already talked a lot about that, um, being an advocate and really um, finding the lane that you're comfortable in while pushing yourself a little bit. So you may not want to be a teacher, but maybe you'll volunteer, right? Maybe you'll help out in some way. Um, but really thinking about yourself, all of us as educators and advocates. Um, and participating in supporting the early education field in some way. We need uh, more teachers um, in the classrooms. We need them to stay <laughs> so we know of what the challenges are. Um, but as I mentioned, that was some of the happiest times in my life um, and really informed the direction of my work now. And so I can't stress enough um, just to be an educator and an advocate. Thanks. Um, th there are two things I would say. One is there's a legislation called the Common Start legislation. Call your legislature, legislator and tell them to support the Common Start legislation and to call you back when they've said, when they've signed on to it. Hold them accountable. Um, one. Two, um, um, Benal just talked about her organization, Neighborhood Village. It's a relatively new organization on the scene and it is perhaps at least in my humble estimation, one of the most innovative change agent, agents I have seen emerge in some years. So I don't know what their website says, but support neighborhood villages because uh, they're they're really um, they I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> so thank you, Benal, and everyone else.
This has been so great. You all have been so inspiring with everything you've said. Um, for me, it's um, really investing and really seeing the importance of your investment when it comes to early, early education and the lives of our children. Um, the investment will have a positive turnaround in the long run. So, you know, we keep saying, you know, we keep advocating, we keep doing the work. And sometimes it just doesn't seem like anyone is listening. But truly, the importance of funding great quality programs, funding, helping teachers stay in their jobs, as Tiara mentioned, is so important. It's like, I want to I want to get to a day where we we're not talking about this anymore that is just happening that we are seeing the importance of our work that we want to see in the importance of our work and putting their money into our work and our field. Thank you everybody. Cool. And thank before, you. Before I, I know Rebecca, you're gonna jump in. I just want to thank you, Ted and Huai, for putting on a great panel tonight and for really digging in, all for all of you for really digging in uh, to ethical principle number eight, right? Reinvestigating our uh, our relationship to time and urgency. I know we're five minutes over our time right now, but I think it's important for everyone on this panel to share and be heard and and kind of get as much out there as we can. Um, and Binal and Tiara, Wayne and Gloria, especially, and Carrie, who is not here. Um, I'm just so thankful for all of you in joining in on this conversation, hopefully uh, the first of many uh, to come, at least in the city of Boston. I'll add my thanks to all of you and to Kim. Um, this could not have been more of what we had hoped for if we had just all scripted it together. So, so thank you so very much for all the prep and all the lifetimes work that went into making tonight what it is and to making early childhood education what it is. Um, next week, we're going to be pivoting a little bit from the people who are holding up the sky for our children to the people who are putting food on our tables. And we're gonna hear from um, a panel that's being pulled together by another one of our amazing colleagues, Becca Berkey, who is not just the director of community engaged teaching and research here at Northeastern, but a scholar in food systems. Becca's gonna lead a conversation about community-driven collaboration for health and safety with farm workers. And just like tonight, we are going to be hearing from the people who are doing the work on the front line. And we will continue to grapple with what it means to be centering the voices of community members in the way that we're making policies and decisions uh, that are affecting people's lives in such real ways. So thank you all. And I hope we'll see a lot of you again next week.